Um, well, thanks very much, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you in Harrogate. It's great to be on stage with Sean. It's even greater that many of you have made it out of bed and through breakfast and have got here in good time. This is one of my favourite places in Britain, this northern town that books the trend with its thriving tourist industry and art scene. It's a joy to see. I spent much of my misspent youth just down the road in Ripon at a night club, club called Slice, which sadly is no more. Um, and, I, I, you know, it's great to come back and to see how well Harrogate is doing. But it's so rare to see that in parts of Britain because despite all of the assets and all of the potential in every part of this country, in towns and villages only a few short miles from here and in every part of the UK, our places and our communities bear the scars of a Britain that just isn't working. For 19 of the last 20 years, only two regions, London and the South East, have had the backing and investment from government to put more in than they take out. Our core cities lag behind London and comparable cities across Europe. And for too long, too many of our towns and villages have been written off by national government altogether. In places that once powered the world, that inheritance and contribution that should have been passed down to children and grandchildren was just thrown away. Young people are told they have to get out to get on. People growing old, hundreds of miles away from children and grandparents. The loss of working age population has taken with it the spending power that sustains our pubs and our banks and our post offices and our bus networks. And even the winners are losing. A million people make their home in London every year, as I did as a young uh, aspiring councillor 20 years ago. This is the region with the highest disposable income in the country by a long stretch. But faced with astronomic housing costs, many of those young people end up worse off than in other parts of the UK. I saw it for myself as a young councillor in Hammersmith at the start of my political journey, representing a generation of young people who were held back by crippling rents and children growing up in damp, cold, overcrowded, squalid conditions that should shame a nation. This is why Southern leaders who try to argue for the status quo are as wrong as Northern leaders who try to pit North against South. Because a country that isn't firing on all cylinders cannot succeed. When we write off most people and most places, we all lose all that talent, all that, those assets, all that potential. And this is what levelling up was meant to solve. And I'll tell it to you straight, I want levelling up to succeed. For me, this is personal. It's about my town, it's about my family, and it's about my community. But I don't think it's a secret to say that it isn't working. Britain just isn't working. There's a lot of analysis in the white paper, I'll grant you that. I've learned a lot that I didn't really need to know about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. I can tell you a great deal about Jericho and I can tell you all about Renaissance Florence. And there is some cross-party support, as you know, for the 12 missions the government has set out, although sadly there is little in the white paper that tells us how they will be achieved. And right now in Parliament we're considering a bill that has the sorry sight of, uh, of legislation that tries to write those missions into law, but buried in the small print is a clause that allows those measures to be torn up at will if the government cannot or will not achieve them. But there's something bigger missing, something bigger than the money, the power, the detail that is missing from the levelling up plan. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. It's trust. There are no new powers, as promised, but instead a process that allows people to bid for a little bit more from central government, but only if they accept governance arrangements imposed on them from Whitehall. There are short-term budget settlements. We moved yesterday from a commitment to a one-year budget settlement to a commitment to a two-year budget settlement that still leave councils in the absurd situation of having to set their budget before they even know what they're going to spend and then resetting the budget before they've even managed to spend it. We've got Hunger Games-style bidding processes that pit area against area, leaving councils to jump through hoops to get a part refund on the 15 billion that's been taken over the last decade and with fewer and fewer staff to do it. 
and council leaders across the country, whether they're Conservative, Labour, Liberal, Democrat, or anything else, still having to go cap in hand to junior ministers to beg for small grants and powers to do the things that we know will work for us. The country simply cannot go on like this. Now, I don't need to tell you this because you know it. You know it because local government, as we just heard from Ben, is on the front line of dealing with the challenges of our age. Turning around four decades of decline in which people have increasingly revolted against a political system that has written them off and counted them out. In an economy reeling from a decade of cuts to frontline services, pay and infrastructure, in the midst of an energy revolution that will leave no family, no part of our economy and no part of our country untouched. When growth is forecast to be the lowest in the G7 next year and inflation is soaring. We meet here in Harrogate after a week of travel chaos, the first national rail strike since the 1980s. But there is a new crisis looming on the horizon, which threatens the vital services that every community relies on. The local government cleaners, the home care workers, the refuse collectors, the teaching assistants, the people who kept this country going during the pandemic at great personal cost and who now can't afford to feed their own families on the money they earn, even as they care for ours. These are the people who have spun gold out of thread over the last decade, during a decade of harsh, deep cuts to the communities that they serve. Inflation is the final straw for them and my heart goes out to every single one of them in their fight for dignity and a wage that they can raise a family on. When did it become so controversial to ask that our frontline workers didn't have to use food banks in order to survive? So my message to the government is this, they have done their job in the most difficult of circumstances. Now you need to do yours. We need an active government that doesn't sit on its hands, but seeks out unions and employers to square this circle together. It is always sensible when circumstances change in politics to change your mind. And any responsible government would recognise that a financial settlement agreed when inflation was forecast to be 5% just simply cannot stand when inflation is 9% and rising. We've just seen our railways grind to a halt while the transport secretary refused to lift a finger. Just last week, he was bragging about the fact that he'd never knowingly met major union bosses. So I say to Michael Gove, the country doesn't need a Grant Shapps Tribute Act. Convene a meeting without delay with the explicit aim of reducing pressure on councils so that they can maintain services and support the staff who are the beating heart that sustains those services too. Do it for the local government workers who desperately need that pay rise. Do it for the council leaders who can't stretch their budgets far enough. And do it because levelling up will never succeed on threadbare services. By my count, nine of the 12 levelling up missions directly rely on the delivery of good, well-funded, publicly delivered services. And in the last 12 years, I've learnt this as Wigan's MP through really tough times, that it's frontline workers who are the experts in how to eliminate waste and spend money more efficiently. They could tell the government right now that social care reforms will cost councils more than they get. And this is what happens when you design a system without the input or a conversation with the people who will deliver it. They don't need a public accounts committee report to tell you that billions of pounds are wasted when levelling up money is allocated by Whitehall instead of the communities who need it in a clunky, bureaucratic, competitive system. They can tell you about the absurdity of West Yorkshire being granted money for buses and South Yorkshire being granted money for bus charging points. Where does this system join up? I'll tell you where it joins up. It joins up in our communities where people know best what they need and how to spend that money wisely. And that is why I've come here today to say to you that trust is the missing ingredient that we need to put back into the system. 
with an active participating government that treats our communities and those who serve them as well as partners working together to rise to these great challenges of our age. It's this approach that will help us through the short-term crisis. It's this approach that will help us meet the long-term challenge of turning around a high-tax, low-growth economy and getting the country firing on all cylinders. Growth is the only way out of this crisis and an economy that doesn't draw on the resources and the assets, the potential and the talent in every part of the country will never succeed. Now the government calls this levelling up, we call it rebuilding Britain, but it can be done because we've done it before. After the war, the government stepped forward to build decent, secure public housing in record numbers and bring public goods back into common ownership to rebuild Britain. In the 70s, we recognised that the ambitions of women and immigrants and working class children were not being matched by the opportunities on offer and we responded with the Race Relations Act and the Equal Pay Act and the establishment of comprehensive education. And in the 1990s, we responded to globalisation with the mantra, education, education, education opening up higher education to a generation, rebuilding schools and sure starts and the education maintenance allowance and aim higher to give young people the chance to compete in a globalised world. The golden thread that ran through this moment was an active government that recognised the challenge of our age and rose to the moment backing its people. But this time it's different because this, none of these challenges that fall to us can be solved from the centre. It will take a nation drawing on all of our assets, the wind, the hydrogen, the solar, the creativity and capacity in every nation and region of the UK. And this, in fact, is the story of Harrogate, this awe-inspiring northern town that was built on a natural asset, sulphur, which produced the spring water that could cure a whole host of diseases. It was local people who saw the potential in that and used it to build the thriving spa town that we meet in today. And that's why I've come here today to tell you that the driving ethos behind the next Labour government will be to smash up a century of centralisation and to restore power to people who will use it to rebuild this country from the ground up. There is a quiet patriotism at work in every part of Britain that draws hundreds of ordinary men and women to serve to serve in many of the roles that you serve in today, to stand for elected office for all political parties and none, to be part of building something in the neighbourhoods where you live and have a stake, that sense of being part of something that is bigger than you are. That is what led me into elective politics in Hammersmith all those years ago, and this, I am convinced, is Britain's great untapped asset, because it's the only way to tackle climate change. It's the only way to reshape our communities. It's the only way to unleash the potential in places instead of managing the problems. To convince the nation that everyone has a role to play and a contribution to make, and we must make it to build an economy that works and a society that can function. This is how we do it. We found so many ways to pull apart in recent years. Yes and no, leave and remain, north and south. But a house divided cannot stand, and it's time to come together and to build. So here's what we'll do. We'll tilt the balance of power back in favour of the creators, the people with a stake in the outcome and skin in the game. No more will we allow people to come in and extract from our communities. Those who are in it for the long haul will feel the system pulling in behind them. So that loophole that allows landlords to buy up houses in places they've never set foot in, housing vulnerable people in substandard housing and charging inflated rates of housing benefit while the community goes to rack and ruin, we'll close it. And that exemption that allows the land registry to withhold information from people about who owns our towns, villages and cities, we'll scrap it. 
We'll end the system that allows foreign buyers to buy up shopping centres and historic buildings and town centres and let them fall into decay and to decline, knowing that eventually the council will have to step in and buy them back using compulsory purchase orders at a premium. No more will we tilt the balance of power in favour of those who extract. We're going to back our people again. And that's why we're working with some of the most affected councils to develop new rules around second homes so that people are in the driving seat of what happens in their own communities. Because these are our places and with small changes, we know you can deliver big outcomes. Now it takes investment, we know it does. And that's why Rachel Reeves, not known for splashing the cash, has promised £28 billion a year every year over in the next decade to win the race for clean energy jobs in every part of Britain. The road to net zero is paved with a million climate jobs and we'll invest to bring them home to the industrial and coastal towns that within living memory powered the world and will do so again. I've seen it for myself in Grimsby and in Rotherham, where far-sighted local leadership a decade and a half ago, matched by political courage and real investment, meant that young people are now powering the world using the legacy of skills from steel and mining. And with backing, young people in every one of our coastal and industrial towns will be able to power us through the next century, just like their parents and grandparents powered us through the last. So we'll do our job, but what we won't do is yours. The last Labour government brought administrative devolution through regional development agencies and we brought political devolution to Scotland and Wales. We work with our great cities across the UK to rebuild from the ashes. The next Labour government will finish the job, but this time we'll give you the powers to deliver your vision for local growth, whether it's control over buses to connect people to apprenticeships and jobs and friends and family, or powers to raise money like the tourist levy being pioneered by Manchester City Council. We'll commit to work with you to move away from grants to real autonomy so that you can expand the housing and the clean energy schemes that have spread across the country that help to generate the revenue that rebuilds the parks and the libraries and the thriving high streets and the youth clubs, those institutions that the MP Jesse Norman once said help to shape and define us as we help to shape and define them. And we know that your governance arrangements have to reflect local unique circumstances, the economic geography, the transport links and the identity that shape a place. So we won't be prescriptive about how you govern, we will only ask that you are genuinely transparent, responsive and accountable to your communities. And our promise in return is that that menu of powers will be on offer to all, not just a favoured few, and that our door and our minds will be not just open, but hungry for change. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking, some of you who've been around for a while, that you've heard some of this before. Every opposition wants to give away power, and governments very rarely do. But if I've learned anything in the last decade as Wigan's MP, it's that no one person has the monopoly on wisdom. Democracy is hard, but the airing of different points of view, that clash of ideas, that leadership that can challenge and compromise and has the courage to change its mind, this is how we get better decisions, this is how we get decisions that last. When did the path of least resistance ever point towards progress? I learned it in my early 20s as a young councillor in West London, helping a community negotiate through shared challenges from hot button issues like parking permits and proposed homeless shelters, to my time as Shadow Foreign Secretary, sitting with Israeli and Palestinian politicians to discuss the shrinking prospects of peace. I've learned that politics is complicated because life is complicated. And our ability, our inability to embrace and deal with difference in politics is a sign of a country and a system that is creaking at the seams. I hear this so often from many of you in this room, especially women who are put off or driven out of elected politics because of the state of our politics. And you know better than anyone what that means. We have got to do things differently. Change only comes when you work with other people, especially those whom you disagree, and you build the widest possible consensus 
for that change, driven by the needs, the views and experiences of people themselves. This is the lesson from 13 years of Labour government that the sure start conceived and funded from Whitehall doesn't survive while the energy co-op co that is owned and run by hundreds of local people in common does. And this is the core of my political belief that everyone has something to offer and something to learn and we build change the only way that counts together. This is what drives me to rail against the paternalism, however well-meaning, doled out by politicians in Westminster and to throw out the patronising attitude that Whitehall knows best about what works for communities that they have never visited, that they know very little of. We do this not just because we want to, not just because we believe it's the right thing to do, we do it because it is the only thing to do. Surely, if we learn anything during the pandemic, looking at the localism that kicked in, people coming together to support their own place, enabling us to roll out the vaccine and test and trace in record time, to find PPE for frontline workers when the national system had collapsed, and to come together to feed hungry children when the government stepped out of the way. Surely, we've learned this that in the end, our best hope is each other. And that means a different sort of leadership. That's what you can expect from the next Labour government, one that partners with the community and puts them in the driving seat. The best councils I've seen across this country are councils who recognise that early and have built that partnership with their own people. Because those with skin in the game and a stake in the outcome Work harder, try longer, think more creatively and do more because they can do no other. I learnt that first from the mums who've been through my constituency surgery over the last decade with children with special educational needs. Whether they had levels of qualifications and educational backgrounds or confidence themselves, they have become world experts in the systems, the opaque systems and the processes surrounding their child's care because it matters so much and this is the great untapped asset that this country has and it is at the core of my political beliefs that only by empowering those people are we going to rebuild Britain. This is why in one of the most centralised countries in the world dominated by Whitehall managerialism in which the contribution of most people and places has been written out and written off we are going to reimagine the state. We're going to push power outwards and we're going to put power back in the hands of people who are already rebuilding Britain from the ground up. Kennedy once said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it the only way that counts together. Thank you.